Europe Barcelona. Um, we are Mireia Colina, Mercedes Reche and, and Ana Ruiz. And this year we are building this local chapter in, in Barcelona. The goal of this project is to help to create and consolidate uh, for a local space network expanding women's opportunities for leadership and professional development, as well as increasing their visibility. Um, this year we start a new edition of Women for Space, a series of conferences that will take place during this course. Uh, currently in online format, do we do that situation? And with them to give visi visibility to, to prominent women in the space sector. Today, our host speaker is Rosé Jonola Parramon. She is a researcher and science at NASA, Goddard Space Flight Center. She studied telecommunications and has a master's degree in photonics and a doctorate in astrophysics, if I say well, Rosé. And today she will explain us the search for exoplanets and the challenge to observe and characterize them. Um, if you have any questions during the, the speech and the presentation of Rosé, you can write it uh, in the chat during the presentation. And then my colleague Mireya will manage uh, these questions after the Rosé speech. So thank you all for participating and enjoying and enjoy a lot this, this presentation. So Rosé, if you want to, to start your presentation and thanks for for your attendance today. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks so much for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, how do we find exoplanets with the next generation of space telescopes. But uh, actually, this is what we want to answer. This is a very simple question to formulate, but extremely difficult to, to answer. And this is, are we alone in the universe? So we actually, what we want is to a step back and ask a rather simpler question, which is, are there Earth-like worlds in, in the universe? Now, growing up, most of us uh, learned that there's nine planets in our solar system, but along the way, we actually lost one, and kids these days learned that there's uh, eight planets in our solar system. However, uh, although there are eight planets in our solar system, there are not eight planets in the universe. This is, this is wrong. Everything changed in, in 1995 with uh, 51 Pegasus B. This was the first ever exoplanet detected. Uh, exoplanet is essentially a planet which orbits a star outside our solar system. Um, and it comes from uh, exoplanet, extrasolar planet. This resulted in uh, Didier Galoz and Michel Mayer to win the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2019. Since then, uh, there's been a huge exploration of exoplanets. Um, so now we actually know about thousands of exoplanets. This animation shows just some of the planets that were discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope. As you can see, they are very different. Our universe is, is creative, it's very diverse. And this is only uh, in our own galaxy. Thanks to Kepler, we know that most of, most of stars in our galaxy actually have planets. Uh, within our solar system alone, there's an incredible diversity and also planetary characteristics. And I'm going to talk about this in a second. But what has changed, though, is how we look at the sky. We have to, now we know that when we count the stars, we're not only counting the stars, we are actually counting exoplanets because they are there, but we cannot see them. So that brings to the next question, which is how do we find an exoplanet? And this is what I'm going to focus on this talk in the technologies that are available to us now and in the future to actually find, detect, and characterize uh, these, these planets outside our solar system. So first, let's see what are the most common techniques. So this is uh, one of the first ones. 
And uh, almost all the planets uh, we know today were discovered with one of these two methods. This is radio velocity, the other one is uh, transit. Um, here, uh, what radio velocity does, uh, it looks at how a planet tacks on their stars while they orbit them. So we can see this wobble, right, of the, of the star. This is what creates this Doppler shift. So with this, the, the light, the wavelength of the light gets compressed and expanded. And we can see the starlight changing from blue to red. Then we can tell that there's actually an exoplanet uh, orbiting this star. This is uh, similar to with what we hear with an ambulance. When uh, an ambulance comes towards us or walks away from us, we can see a difference in pitch. This is the, solar, uh, the Doppler effect, and this is what's actually happening here. Uh, the transit method is a bit simpler to understand. So when we have a, an exoplanet orbiting a star, when it comes in front of it, uh, what happens is the planet blocks a bit of the starlight. And we can see if we uh, stare at the star this deep on uh, light intensity. With this, we can find information about the orbit and the planet radius. Here, for example, uh, we have a system with three planets of different sizes and different orbits. If we look at the light curve, we can see the first one. It's a very, uh, it's a big planet. We have this big dip in light. Now, when the other two come together, we will see that actually we have a different type of dimming of the starlight. And with this information, because of the periodicity, we can infer that there are planets there. However, with these two methods, what's happening is we can get information about the orbit of the planet, the mass of the planet, and the radius. But those are indirect methods. We are not looking at the planet directly. We are looking at the variation of the star. However, with transits, uh, I must say that we can get some more information about the planet. Because when the planet goes in front of the star, the planet atmosphere absorbs some of the light of the star. So we can then compare and see get some information about the exoplanet atmosphere and get more information uh, from that. Those are the two most popular and used methods uh, up to date. Um, this is one of the mo most challenging ones, which is called microlensing. So if, when we have a, a star emitting uh, light, if there's a massive star coming in front of it, that creates basically a magnifying lens effect and it focuses the light. Now, if there's a planet orbiting uh, that star, we have a small peak added to that light curve. So we can tell there's an actually a companion to that star. Um, astrometry is uh, also a method uh, that has been used, but this one is extremely, extremely challenging. Uh, essentially, what we are using here is a, is a massive planet orbits a star and makes it wobble in a space. If we have an other a star that we can use as reference and compare the relative position, we can tell if there's a planet or not orbiting this star. Now, uh, this is a very, very tricky method uh, because actually to do this from Earth is, is or it's impossible almost because we have the atmosphere. And just uh, the atmosphere creates, um, distorts the starlight. So we, it's very difficult to uh, see if the variation comes from the, our own atmosphere or from a movement due, due to a planet orbiting at the star. Now, um, the only method actually that it's a direct, direct uh, imaging method is this one, which uh, is called coronography, and I'm gonna talk about it in more detail later. But the idea is that what we want to do is to block the starlight so then we can see the planet. The, the difference of intensity of a star and a planet is the, the order of 10 to the 10. So the planet is much, much dimmer. Uh, you can imagine that what uh, direct imaging does, in this case, coronography, is uh, the same as when you're driving. If you have the sun in front of you, you cannot see the road, then you put the, your sun visor down and you can see a bit more. So you're blocking your source of light so you can see the surroundings of the star. And this would be the only method to actually see directly uh, the planet light. So going back to the question, are there Earth-like worlds in the universe? The quick answer is yes. Um, 
So you probably remember this. Uh, this is one of the most exciting recent exoplanet discoveries, and it's the Chappis one system. It was all over the news in, in 2017. Uh, this planet's orbit uh, dim red star about 40 light years away, and it's its own solar system. Uh, this, this system, the Trappist one system, has actually seven planets orbiting this star. And here you can see the, comp uh, the comparison of the Trappist one system with our own solar system. Actually, in size, it's, it's more similar to the Jupiter and its moons than our own solar system. You can see here that it's much, much uh, smaller. This is because uh, uh, the Trappist one sun and our own sun are very different too. Uh, this Trappist one system was actually uh, detected using the transit method that I mentioned earlier. And here we can see how, for example, for Trappist one B, which is the biggest uh, planet in the system, the dip of light is, is much bigger. And the farther away the planet is, the longer the transit uh, is um, in the light curve of Trappist one H, for example. Um, in February 2018, a closer study of the seven plants suggested that some of them could actually harbor water. Uh, it would be in a gas form in the closer planets, liquid form in the, the medium distance planets, and in ice form in the GH planets, for example. So now let's see. Okay, so now we know that there's Earth like planets. So, what, how can we? be sure that these planets are Earth-like. So to do this, let's take a look at our own solar system. So this is a simulation of our own solar system as if we were looking at it from far away with a telescope. The, the, the image on the left, we can see that there's this halo and the star is very bright, so we can't see anything. So in this, uh, this zoom panel, uh, here I have actually removed the star and I'm just showing the planets and um, this bright uh, region in the middle is not is not actually the star. This is the, the dust um, around the star uh, that gets uh, its bright due to the presence of the star when it's there. Now, okay, so what, how do we say again that we, we have an Earth-like wall? So what we want to look at is not only, again, detecting this exoarch, we want to characterize it. Characterizing means looking at the spectrum to see what's the chemical composition of the atmosphere. So, for example, for Earth, we know what are what we uh, call the biosignature. So, for example, are the oxygen and ozone, which is produced uh, by living organisms. There's also uh, the vegetation, and due to the photosynthesis, so we have this oxygen uh, absorption line. Also, um, we also have the water vapor that creates this absorption. Can you see my mouse? No. Um, Okay, well, where it says water vapor, this is the, the absorption um, of light by the water vapor in the atmosphere. And at the, at the far infrared, at the near infrared range of the spectrum, we can actually look at methane, for example, uh, which is due to uh, bacteria present in, in the planet. So those are the kind of things we, we want to see from a planet to be able to tell uh, if A, it's uh, habitable, or be even if it's inhabited. Now, so I presented the different kind of detection methods. Um, and as of yesterday, there have been already 4,331 confirmed exoplanets. So I mentioned uh, most of these exoplanets have been detected via the transit method or radial velocity. However, uh, the direct imaging method remains a very, very challenging method. And actually, less than seven, uh, less than 100 exoplanets have been uh, directly imaged. Now, if we look at this plot, we can see that these planets are bigger than Jupiter. And what we want to do is direct detection uh, to Earth-like planets, which are much lower. Now, this is extremely challenging for two main reasons. First, is what we call the flux ratio, because the uh, the the star is ten to the ten times brighter than uh, Earth, our Earth. 
So for example, here is what we would see if we look at the star. There's actually the three planets, um, Venus, Earth, and Jupiter here, but we cannot see because we are completely blinded by the star. Now, uh, the second issue is the proximity of the planet to the parent star. So the closer the planet is to the star, the most difficult, more difficult it's going to be for us to actually see it. And in these plots at the bottom, we can see that the size of the telescope actually is going to help us separate the planet from the star. So for a two-meter telescope on the left, we can see that a planet, the apparent position of the planet with respect to the star is much closer. And it would be impossible for us without using any method to, to see the, the, the light of the planet and uh, from the, the starlight. Even for a 10 meter telescope, we can see that the, the light of the planet is uh, five orders of magnitude uh, dimmer than the starlight. And actually, if we were not to use any techniques to see the planet, um, the planet light uh, with the starlight there, we would need a, a telescope of two kilometers diameter, which is obviously impossible uh, to put in a space. So here we can see again the kind of situation we cannot see the planet. Now, why do we want to access uh, to be so close to to the star and to look at planets there? It's because what we call the habitable zones. Different types of a star present different uh, different habitable zones. They are the different distance. So the warmer the star, the farther away the habitable zone is. So here we can see that uh, for a sun like a star, we are about the uh, one AU. This is our habitable zone, but M, uh, M2B stars actually, uh, which are much cooler, the habitable zone, it's much, much closer to the star. So we, we want to be able to, we want to design an instrument in which we can actually dim the starlight to the point that we can see planets that are that close to its parent star. So how do we do this direct imaging of uh, Earth-like walls in the universe? And the answer is coronography. So in this, uh, this is a video that explains how um, coronag coronography works. Um, there's a lot of technology development in this field, and this is my main field of research. Now, um, let's see how, how this works in detail. So let's imagine we have uh, two planets orbiting a star. And now we want to see these planets again directly. So what we're going to have is a telescope in a space. So the atmosphere of Earth doesn't distort our measurement. And we're going to point this telescope a straight to the star. A straight says that the starlight goes completely on axis with our system. This is going to go through a set of optics, which introduce some operations in the system. And it's going to reach our detector. This is the if the perfect case scenario. Now we are going to introduce our coronographic masks. So first is the coronograph mask itself. So here we are dimming the starlight. And with the Leo stop, which is another mask of the system, we are reducing as much as possible the starlight. So now we are creating this dark zone for the planet. Now the planet, because it's orbiting, the star is coming at an angle and it's missing the, the coronographic mask and reaching our detector. But we see something like this. This is the aberrations introduced by the system because it's not perfect. So to correct this, we have this special mirror called the deformable mirror, and we create this feedback loop in which we use this mirror to correct for the imperfections of our optical system. By doing that, we remove as much as possible the starlight, and then we can see uh, that the planets start to appear in our system. Uh, here we have the two planets. But as I mentioned before, this is the detection. We want to characterize these exoplanets. And to do that, we do the spectroscopy of these exoplanets. So by introducing a prism or some kind of uh, instrument there, we can look at the spectrum and see that these different absorption uh, lines. So here in this simulation, we have water, oxygen, methane. So we can tell if these planets are inhabitable or could be inhabited. So this is a very 
new technique for a space. This, this technique has been used uh, massively in ground-based observatories, but um, again, because we have the atmosphere, uh, the atmosphere actually distorts the planet light. And you can see that the small distortions actually uh, basically block you for, from seeing uh, the planets uh, that are, are Earth-like planets. So in, this is the timeline of uh, exoplanet space missions. Um, on the top row, we, we can see the exoplanet specific missions and the bottom row is um, space missions that have exoplanet capabilities. So we are uh, right before Web. Um, so Web is meant to be launched soon and it's gonna have um, exoplanet detection and characterization, characterization capabilities. However, this is at the infrared range, so we won't be able to access some of the biosignatures that uh, would confirm Earth-like planets with it. Also, the size of web is uh, a bit limited in terms of resolutions. I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. But uh, the first, actually, uh, telescope that's going to have a coronagraph, which is actively controlled, as I showed in the in the video before, with these deformable mirrors, it's going to be the Roman Space Telescope. Uh, this is what we call a, a technology demonstrating instrument, um, and basically it's paving the way for the next generation of a space telescopes that are going to be much much bigger, and with much more exoplanet uh, detection and characterization capabilities. And the two I uh, I'm been involved is mainly Luar and a bit with Habex. And those uh, two missions are uh, part of the Astro 2020 Digital sur uh, Survey. Now, um, just a quick summary of this, what this Astro 2020 Digital Survey is. So every 10 years, the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine in, in, in the US calls for input for what they call the Digital Survey. Um, and as it says here, the institutional goal of a decadal survey is to consider the past and current research of, of the field and provide consensus recommendations for the direction of the field over the next decade. So essentially, uh, committees are created within this decadal survey. And then uh, different uh, studies and white papers are presented. And, and then this is what decides what's going to be prioritized in the next 10 years. So for example, uh, Hubble. Uh, was a recommendation from a decadal survey. The James Webb Space Telescope was a recommendation as well. The Roman Space Telescope, the, the Alma Observatory in Chile, this is not limited to space. It's also ground-based facilities. So in 2016, NASA commissioned uh, four mission concept studies. So basically funded uh, four teams of scientists and, and engineers uh, to do a studies of what where the next, what should the next generation of a space telescope be? Um, and actually these two were the ones with more exoplanet uh, detection and characterization capabilities. And uh, I've been part uh, of the Luwara study office at NASA Goddard um, since 2017. So let's talk a bit more about Luwara. So LUAR stands for the Large UV Optical Infrared Surveyor. This is a, what we call an axis telescope, and it has a 15 meter aperture and it's built out of 120 segments. So here we can see how, uh, how it's built. We, we have the primary and the secondary mirror, the sunshade. Um, there's a, a spacecraft bus under, under the sunshade and all the science instruments are the, at the back of the, of the primary mirror. Um, one of the instruments for Luar is what is called Eclipse, which is the coronagraph instrument, which stands for Extreme Coronagraph for Living Planetary Systems. Now, this is a comparison of Luar with the current and near future telescopes. You can see the Hubble Space Telescope on the very left is only 2.4 meter telescope. And by being 2.4 meter telescope, it has provided an immense amount of, of science in all fields of astronomy. JWST will provide a, a big jump um, in size, which means a jump uh, in also in, in resolution. So we expect uh, our uh, knowledge of, of a space will increase massively. But if we look now at Luar A and Luar Light, or which is um, a smaller version of Luar, uh, which is an eight meter one, 
you can see that things are going to be very different if we, if we manage to have these telescopes in the space. Now, why uh, do we want such a big telescope and why is it segmented? So basically, we want it segmented so it fits at a you know, rocket fairing. So here we have um, an animation of the, of the telescope deployment in a space. So we have the sun shades opening. Now we have the sun shield to protect the telescope from the sun. So once this is fully open, we'll have the secondary mirror unfolding. And finally, the wings of the telescope open to create this 15 meter aperture. This is by itself just the unfolding a feat of, uh, of engineering. Um, these are very, very complex system and the vibrations from the launch are, it's very delicate. So coming up with a way to uh, pack and deploy this kind of system is already uh, a massive engineering challenge. Now, uh, Loire, actually, the size and the, fold, uh, the folding has been designed so it could fit in some of, of, this, um, of these rockets, uh, which are actually under development. Currently, there's no uh, rocket that could uh, lift Loire into orbit. Um, but these three are under development, and they, could, they have the, the, the range the, in, in terms of weight to, and volume to fit this kind of big observatories. Now, so why the 15 meters telescope, which is, up, uh, which is really, really big compared to the current space telescopes, but actually moderate in size com compared to the ground telescopes. So these are the main three advantages of having um, a big telescope, but actually why we, why we want a big telescope, because the bigger telescope, the more exo-Earth we can find, which we, this is what we call the exo-Earth yield. So first this increased sensitivity. So the bigger the telescope, the more photons we can collect. We could look at it as basically if you're trying to collect water uh, with, a bucket, with a bucket. The bigger the bucket, the more water you will be, will be collecting. So imagine the water drops are the photons. So you want a telescope, an aperture as big as possible. The second one is the increased angular resolution, which is equivalent actually or getting closer. So the bigger the telescope, the, the much smaller our resolution element uh, it's gonna be. So we will be able to separate the background from the planet, as you can see here in this comparison from uh, between a four meter telescope and a 12 meter telescope. And finally, um, as I mentioned before, we want to access regions that are close to the star. This is what we call the inner working angle of the coronagraph. So we want this inner working angle to be as close to the star as possible. Now, this inner working angle is uh, proportional to the inverse of the diameter. So the bigger the diameter, the closer regions we can access. So we want this as big as possible. So now, what is actually the exoplanet yield in these different scenarios? So here, this is a simulation that we did um, in which we look at our uh, a sky, uh, in this case, with a four uh, meter space telescope. Under this situation, we could only um, see six exoart candidates. Now, saying, that we could only see six exoart doesn't mean we wouldn't see other exoplanets, but not uh, Earth-like planets. But we could see a lot of hot Jupiter, Venus equivalents, etc. Now, what happens if we actually increase, we double the size of this telescope? Now we have 25 exoart candidates. Let's go one step further and go to the size we want. 15 meter space telescope essentially gives us 100 exoart. So the number of exoart planets detected quadruples as the telescope mirror size doubles. And when once we have about 100 uh, exoart or more, we can actually start doing a statistics of uh, habitability, Earth-like planets, etc. Now, going back to our previous, previous simulation of our uh, solar system and the kind of features we want to, to be able to measure with the Louvoir in this case, the Louvoir coronagraph instrument. So now, again, if we didn't have anything 
uh, any mask or any instrument and we look at our own solar system for far, from far, far away, this is what we would see, nothing, just the star. Now, we can, uh, we did some simulations within Louvoir to actually uh, see how we would be able to observe our solar system from, from afar. And in these simulations, we included uh, not only the, the planets and the observatory, but we actually accounted for the aberrations that I showed in the video about the coronagraph before, the correction of these aberrations, and many other sources of, of noise and errors in the telescope. But, and this is what we saw, that with a 15 meter telescope and this kind of instrument with the tolerances uh, that are required, we would be actually able to detect and characterize uh, an Earth, Earth, our Earth, or um, an Earth-like planet in a nearby solar system. So to conclude, I just wanted to say that well, ch children now learn that there are walls orbiting uh, other stars, and our aim, as uh, in my team and in the exoplanet community is to be able with the same certainty uh, to tell that there is life in some of these other worlds. And to do that, uh, we need this kind of instruments and the space telescopes. And the thing is that we can actually meet this goal within the next 20 years, uh, because there is the know-how uh, to identify habitable planets around other stars and, know, and actually look and search for the biosignatures or the signs of life there. So with this, I conclude, I'll leave you some more information about LUAR, the LUAR mission concept itself, and uh, NASA exoplanet exploration efforts. Um, so that's it, thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Rosé. I was really convinced that the conference will be interesting, but it has been really, really amazing. Thank you for your time and Thank for you. your inspiring work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have some questions. Okay. I have a few questions. In the meantime, that I ask if anyone has a question, could just write it on the chat on ask to, to, to the question itself. Okay, we will move to, to attendance questions in a few minutes. Um, Rose, my first question is, is regarding young girls' dreams. Since you were a girl, you already knew what you would like to become, or it has just... Um, not really. Um, I mean, as a kid, I was interested in the space, but not out of the ordinary. I mean, I always thought it was really, really cool. Um, but I, what I was more interested in, it was what became engineering, right? It's uh, building things, destroying things sometimes, uh, but actually understand how things work. And this is how eventually brought me to engineering and then like seizing different opportunities, I end up here. But my main focus was always like, Kind of, I was. I knew I was interested in more in engineering and how things work in general. Mm -hmm. And this is, is also the reason because you studied engineering. I exactly. Guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. My second question is about issues uh, to be a woman in in a space field. Do you think that your career would have been easier if you were a man? Um. This is uh, a question that's uh, hard to answer. Um, in my career, I've actually been very lucky that uh, all my colleagues and supervisors have been very, very supportive of my career. Now, um, it's worth acknowledging though, uh, this is currently a male dominated world and mostly uh, now that I'm in the US, it's mostly a white, male dominated world and yes uh it can be it could have been different i'm not entirely sure about that um but it's more in the terms you know it's representation in a way at sometimes i did feel uh, uh, 
early in my career, it can be a bit daunting. You enter a room and, you know, they're in a meeting and there's 20 people and there's only another woman. So it can be a, a bit daunting. Um, but in my case, um, I think um, I've had opportunities that I'm very grateful for. Uh, I'm aware that there's issues and in academia, it's, it's, it's well, it's been in the news uh, a lot that there's massive issues and, but I'm very hopeful things are being corrected. There's efforts being made in many institutions to change that. Um, obviously there's still things going on and, you know, it's a work in progress, um, mm -hmm. but you know, wage inequalities are there, but this is something that um, is being corrected in my opinion, at least in, in my niche of a field that I am, right? I cannot talk. For, for everyone, of course. Um, but yeah, my, my experience has been good, mostly good. Obviously there's the small things, but we cannot generalize. This is really great. Um, okay, just last question that then we move to, to the tenants. I have another question more focused on the space field itself. Mm -hmm. How do you value either space sector, both positive and negative sides and its impact on our society. We are well, so I deep can, in our questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very deep. Um, I can talk, I mean, more than aerospace sector, I'm more focusing on the ex ex space exploration sector. Um, I have to say, it's like, I'm, I mean, I value it very positively. The challenge that the space exploration has faced has uh, led to technological and scientific advances that have benefited society in many, many fields. Uh, I mean, the medical field, uh, transportation, public safety, energy, et cetera. There's been a lot of technologies that come from, from the space exploration uh, field. I mean, one that we use almost every day, the GPS. This came from early satellites launched in orbit that this is why GPS was developed. And now, I mean, who can live without their phone GPS when moving around? So yes, I mean, this, you know, maybe there's no, at the time of development um, of technologies for space exploration, sometimes we cannot see an, a direct application in our daily life. But as years pass, we can see that these technologies are, that were developed early have uh, evolved to something that's become very, very useful for society. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, we have several questions. Um, the first one is from Susanna Svensdotter, and she asks, how do you produce the data from our solar system to test the LUVAR system? Okay, good question. Uh, so that data was created by a team at Godert, um, and it's available. Let me actually share this again. So here you can see uh, this website here. Uh, so this is called the High Stacks Project. And um, yeah, it's available for download if anyone wants to play with it. But it comes from measurements of uh, our own atmosphere and the planet. So they use the, the different uh, satellite information and ground-based observation information to generate the spectrum of the different planets in our solar system, as well as the debris disk and the Hubble data from the, uh, the galaxy, uh, the background galaxies. Okay, perfect. I hope that that's, that answers the question of Suzanne. Um, okay, Joan Aragonés is asking if the presentations will be available afterwards. Yes, uh, Anna, as, as Anna said, uh, we are recording the session. It will be um, in our uh, social networks. I would, if you want to just uh, share or uh, just see it again, okay, you could, you could see it. Uh, Antonio Marzoa Dominguez is asking, do you think that the new generation of segmented space telescopes such as James Webb or Luvior would be, uh, let's say, better detection instruments for exoplanets compared to the ground-based observatories considering, considering the current developments in adaptive optics 
and the fact that the ground-based instruments has a quite larger diameter. Furthermore, aren't you worried about the introduction of diffraction artifacts due to segmentation in the generations of new space telescopes? He knows about the theme. <laughs> yeah, no, and these are really, really great questions. And I actually, my main work for Louvoir um, was the second part of the of the question, which is the diffraction artifacts, I, the, the quantification and tolerancing of the diffraction artifacts due to the segmentation. Um, okay, first part of the of the question: ground-based uh, versus space-based. So, in the ground, we are limited by the atmosphere, and this is a fact. So, if there's uh, certain wavelength ranges that we have to be in the space to be actually able to access it properly. Um, not only this, there's the attenuation of the atmosphere, but also there's the time variation of the atmosphere that distort uh, the light from the sky. Mm -hmm. So when we say, uh, and also another thing, the space is much darker. So actually to get to this 10 to the 10 contrast level, we do have to be in a space. Um, Ground-based telescopes are not uh, really aiming. I think currently there's been 10 to the minus six kind of detections. Uh, they're pushing for 10 to the minus eight, but when we get to 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 12 uh, contrast ratio, uh, we will have to go to space. Uh, now with the segmentation. Yes, this introduces uh, different types uh, of errors. So basically when we look at segmentation we'll have two things right we will have uh the errors of manufacturing and uh and assembling so we'll have some segments that might be a bit off and then we'll have uh an issue if the se uh, segments vibrate right during an observation so this is so we can this is what we call dynamic and static aberrations so to correct for the static aberrations what we use is these the four mobile mirrors and we correct for it so this is one thing we, we can take care of it. Now for the dynamic operations, this is a bit more complicated. So the doing some I did some studies about the tolerancing, and um, the conclusion is if if you have residuals of these dynamic errors that are below the 10 picometer level RMS, um, then you can actually achieve this 10 to the minus 10 contrast. Here's the thing. The coronographic masks are actually designed for this 10 to the minus 11, maybe. And so we have a bit of room for some kind of dynamical errors. Now, um, we've been working with industry partners uh, to see if this would be manufacturable, and it is. And the segments actually are going to be self-correcting in a way in terms of vibration. There's um, laser metrology. Uh, and edge sensors that are going to be used to measure and then compensate some of, the, of these operations, which is going to result in residuals below this 10 to the uh, this 10 picometer RMS level. Sorry, this was a bit of a technical answer, but the, the, the it was fairly technical. That's perfect. Um, okay, um, I have further questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Ivan Semarno White, oh, sorry. Herman Nokian is asking, which is the best electromagnetic spectrum to detect biomarkers when analyzing Earth-like exoplanets? So most uh, biosignatures are actually in the visible, visible to near infrared part of the spectrum. So this is why we want to access that. And this is why this is what we have on Earth in our atmosphere. This is one is going to, uh, if we have an, uh, a ground-based telescope, it's going to be attenuated by this. This is why we want to go to space to, to access these regions. Also, in these regions, the wavelength is shorter, um, which means the resolution is higher. Because the resolution of an instrument is, again, it's dependent on the wavelength and the telescope diameter. Mm -hmm. So we want the smaller wavelength and the larger telescope diameter to have the best resolution that we can. Perfect. OK. Um, OK, Eduardo Monra has a comment. Uh, he said, but I will transform in, in a question. Do you think that possibly the moon is the solution? P possibility of construction without atmosphere and without artificial satellites? Um, so this is a, a topic that keeps 
been brought up uh, over the years. Um, so basically, you would have to do that on the dark side of the moon, which means um, that although it's not illuminated, you don't have control of where it is. And also you can have a still vibrations and things due to the, the, the movement. This is why you want, actually want to position these telescopes in very stable Lagrange points, L2, which is the most stable Lagrange, uh, Lagrange point. Uh, also construction in the moon, it's not a straightforward and the conditions are very, very harsh. There's no atmosphere, it's very cold. Uh, there's actually zero light. So um, this is not uh, the best solution in, in, in my opinion and in the opinion of uh, most people in the field. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are a lot of comments that is saying, thank you for the amazing presentation. Uh, thank you for the answers. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Thank you for the answers. Uh, another question, <laughs> last last minute question, uh, uh, with from Artemis Westenberg. Why would Jules Verne classify our sun as a class four star? Is none of the classifications I can find this for our sun? I don't think I'm equipped to answer this this question properly. Um, I'm an engineer, I'm not an astronomer, and I don't have much insight of why some stars are classified in in which class or not. Um, okay. Okay. Um, and finally, I have a, a oops, from, uh, okay. Art Artemis is asking, yeah. from Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne mentions this, I am reading it, and researching it hints my question. Yeah, I, I'd say try to reach out to an astronomer that um, studies, focuses their, their field of research and the stars. They will have much of an insight uh, to this. I I mainly focus on um, the technologies for exoplanet mm -hmm. exploration. Okay, okay. Thank you. And um, I have a, just a final question. Okay, if there are no further questions. Um, which message do you want to transmit to the new generations? I'd say if you're interested in this, go for it. It can feel daunting sometimes. I mean, and I partly, I mean, excited and daunting. And I partially blame like Hollywood movies about, you know, what working at NASA or working in the space exploration or this kind of science is. But if, if you're interested, just do it. And there's not one way uh, to do this kind of this kind of work, um, you know, I'm a telecommunications engineer and I'm doing exoplanet detection at NASA now. I just, I went a bit, I didn't go in a straight line uh, to get where I am. And most of my colleagues are going from engineering, but there's people from biology actually working with me, um, you know, because we are trying to detect biosignatures. So whatever you do, be interested in it, you know, and then things are gonna come to you and. Yeah, there's so much to discover still. And I think, you know, collaborations are important. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And yeah, just go for it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just to explain everybody that uh, next conference that we will do uh, the next month, it will be with Alicia Verde. And she will explain us about uh, dark, uh, a space um, and more message of for thank you um, and and congratulations for for the presentations and if there are not further questions thank you very much everybody to be here to take some of your time and and thank you Rosé you could be really proud of your work uh, it's amazing and thank you to find a little of your time to share with with us uh, your knowledge and your work. Thanks so much for for having me today. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a nice day, and remember that in one month approximately, follow us in our social networks. We will have another inspiring woman uh, to present another uh, amazing work. Thank you very. Thank you.
everybody. Bye.